chapter 26 verse 2 it says a curse does not not come without a cause a curse will not alight without a cause mm -hmm. and um, so there's always always a cause for a curse and um, you know through as you know through ministering with so many people yes. um, you know when praying for deliverance of people or just you know praying you and you you can see that you know all through the Different times. Yeah, you can, you, and that's an interesting scripture that you bring up because it says an undeserved curse will not come to rest. So it tends to mean that if you're in a, not in agreement with the curse, if you're not coming into agreement with the curse, it's not going to have a place to rest upon you. But what we found, Donna, with people that are in our counseling is that um, if they do come into agreement with that curse, then it gives the enemy a legal right to have that place, have that curse land. Um, we counsel a lot of kids that are um, six years old when they were in, in first grade and you bring up the first grade school teacher to them and you know their continence changes and they become um, very concerned about the fact that you're bringing up that first grade teacher. Um, that is and can be an ungodly soul tie where those teachers you know that's the year where the kids are having to stay in order and sit in their chairs and be um, orderly as opposed to being in kindergarten and if the classroom is overwhelmed, you'll see that the teachers, a lot of times, will send out a curse on these children by speaking the fact that they may be ADD or they need to be tested for ADD. And the first thing you know, the children are sent out to be tested. And a little six-year-old child is going to come into agreement with, wow, I am ADD. And, and that's, a, that's a specific curse that they come into agreement with. And you're finding a lot more children are having to be um, medicated. Say, I am. ADD. Um, so, you know, they've come into agreement with it. They come into agreement that they're not worthy. And, and, I, and I believe that has a lot to do with many of the things that are being diagnosed out there and why it's so rampant today. Joyce Myers this morning speak that your words give you power. Um, you, it can either be power to increase you or power to take away. Wow. But words have power. Yes. You know so many uh, of examples of that as well of self-imposed curses. Yeah, you know? I think I think as Christians, you know, we have a tendency that we want to forgive others and we, you know, we you know, the scripture that we don't concentrate on the log in our brother's eye um, or the the timber in our brother's eye when we have a log in our own. So, you know, we tend to be more merciful and graceful with others and forgiving with others, but a lot of times we're not that forgiving with ourselves, especially if we have a high truth benchmark. Um, it's almost self-sacrificing. It's a little self-inflicting. You can wound yourself, and you speak those curses over yourself. I'm not good enough. I should have known better. I should have seen that coming. Um, and you and you and you start speaking, you know, things like, you know, I'm so stupid, or you know, and you curse yourself. I know that when we take people through deliverance, we always have them speak out those that people's names that they need to forgive, and and speak out a forgiveness proclamation. And I always have them put their own name on the list because, you know, the chances are they're, they have, they're less forgiving of themselves and the things that they've done in error um, than they are of others. Um, and, and so, you know, it's important that they release forgiveness towards themselves and be very careful about the words that you speak over yourselves. I mean, if you start to think about or listen to what you're speaking, you're going to hear a lot of things coming out of your mouth that, that aren't necessarily healthy and edifying and uplifting. No. Right. Right. And, you know, there's also planned professional curses, you know, through witches and mm -hmm. wizards and, mm -hmm. um, you know, mediums and things like that, you know. And uh, we need to be aware of those things mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, I know in, in one of the ministries that we were in, um, they, we did actually have a witch come in that was practicing and she was in prostitution. And as they, they shared that story with us, 
Um, she knew exactly what she was doing through an ungodly soul tie. And, you know, 2 Corinthians 6.16, it talks about your body as the holy temple and why would you unite with a prostitute um, and let that in? You know, you right. become w yoked as one, yes. one flesh, just yes. as you would. And because of that um, coming together in that soulish realm, that witch knew exactly that those men that were coming in, that she had a legal right to impart way more into them than they were expecting. Right. So when they went out spiritually, they were um, very much uh, oppressed with a lot of demonic activity because she had that legal right to do that. And she did set those curses out over those men as they came in to sleep with her. That's right. And even just, um, you know, sleeping with people in general that you're not married to right. and the two becoming one, you know, those things that the other person had, well, you just became one with that person and you don't know what they've done or mm -hmm. the things they've been involved with and everything, you know. Um, <clears throat> for example, we had prayed for this one gentleman. He was really, at one point, was really, uh, you know, deeply involved in witchcraft. I mm -hmm. mean, to the point of, you know, the blood covenants and all, right. all kinds of things, you know. But he was sort of, he would tell about, you know, how many women he'd been with and everything. And, you know, these women probably have no idea mm -hmm. what, you know, what they've just, the things that they probably have now, mm -hmm. that they don't even know how they got it. They just know there's something wrong and something yeah. going on now. I have, um, I have had the opportunity to volunteer in a, in a nursing home situation. And um, one of the women that I was visiting with over a period of time began to ask me questions about what I did um, in counseling and that sort of thing. And I, I asked her if she'd ever accepted the Lord. And she said no, that she believed in her heart, but no one had ever actually prayed with her and accepted her. And, and as we began to share and talk, um, she had Parkinson's disease. And I asked her um, very innocently, knowing the answer, Did, does Parkinson's run in, your, run in your bloodline? Is it an inherited disease? Or, and she said, no, you, it's not like that. It doesn't run in our bloodline. She said, I'm going to tell you something that's going to very much amaze you. And she kind of sat back, and I waited. And she said that um, her husband had died from Parkinson's. And I looked at her and I thought, well, I'm not easily moved. And she looked at me and she said, you know, how come you're not surprised about that? And I said, well, can I ask you a personal question? And she said, sure. And I said, did you sleep with him before you married him? And she looked at me and she said, interesting, yes, 11 years. And I said, was he controlling? And she said, yes, he was very demonstrative and battering almost. And I said, well, you know, I explained to her about the ungodly soul tie and how his things, even his disease, had a legal right to come over into her. And so, you know, we took her through the, um, the, the prayer of salvation. And she was fairly, um, she had Parkinson's exaggerated. I don't want to speak anything over her. But when I came in the next week to visit with her, um, what she shared with me was she was in such a drug state um, because of the pain meds that she was on, that she dreamed a lot. And in that dreaming, her um, husband, her late husband, was actually tormenting her and chasing her in all of her dreams. And her days were just filled with anxiety from being in and out of dreams where she was being tormented and chased by her ex-husband or her late husband. So when we broke the ungodly soul tie, even in the state and the condition that she was in, the next week I came in to visit her, she had this big smile on her face. And I said, what is it? Well, she had accepted the Lord. We broke the ungodly soul tie, and she um, said, you know, I have these beautiful dreams now, and he's not chasing me, but we had to break that spirit.